Welcome to The Growing Band Director, the podcast that dives into topics applying to all of us band directors. My name is Kyle Smith, and joining me is my friend and colleague, Jeff Smith. Together, we discuss many aspects of a school band program, including how to build your concert, jazz, and marching programs, as well as everything else we do as band directors. More importantly, we'll discuss concepts that help us all improve our own programs every day. Always remember the famous quote by Ray Kroc, when you're green, you're growing, and when you're ripe, you rot. Let's get started. All right, everybody, it is so great to be back with you. Um, I'm with one of my good friends, Mr. Tom Lazat. Tom, welcome. Thank you. Um, we, I will refer to him as TL, as many of his students and colleagues have. Um, just a couple, a couple bits of information about TL. Um, he's a member of the Maine Music Educators Hall of Fame, recipient of the 2019 John Laporta Award from Gen and Berkeley College of Music, contributor to the Instrumentalist Magazine, longtime band director um, in Massachusetts and Maine who is recently retired, um, frequent judge and clinician in all areas of instrumental music, um, and just last weekend was awarded Massachusetts Association of Jazz Educators Lifetime Achievement Award and least importantly, um, an avid Cubs fan. Um, TL, it is great to have you with us. Um, this episode is entitled The 10 Deadly Sins of Music Making. Um, before we get to that real quick, I wanted to share this really great b- bit of um, thing that um, my wife sent me. Um, this is 10 things that require zero talent. So here's 10 things we can all do Um, better in our job and in our life. And these are things that require zero talent. So being on time, work ethic, effort, energy, body language, passion, doing extra, being prepared. As John Wooden says, what is it? Um, Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Um, Being coachable and having a positive attitude. So those are 10 things that require no talent. Um, all right. So TL, can you give us the background behind this 10 deadly sins of music making? Where does this come from and what's the genesis of all this? Well, uh, Kyle, the way you started was great because it, so much of that filters into exactly what we're going to be talking about today. So the, the inspiration for this um, podcast came from a uh, book that I've been reading by Richard Floyd. Richard Floyd, if you don't know him, is... Uh, maybe the godfather of music education in the state of uh, Texas. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a book, uh, The Seven Deadly Sins of Music Making, in which he deals uh, into a number of things that we do uh, wrong as as, uh, band directors and things that really cut things off at the past. That was a follow-up book to, I think, maybe the best book on music education that I've ever read, and that's uh, is the artistry of, of uh, teaching and uh, making music. And uh, it really, really makes a, a significant case for teaching band as an art as opposed to teaching band as a craft. And he looking at it in terms of that is a great advocacy for us. Because right now we play by other rules. We play, play by the math science uh, aspect of things rather than the uniqueness of, of what we do. So it was um, those uh, two books that really inspired me uh, in a number of ways. And uh, anything by Richard Floyd is just absolutely, it's, it's, it's money in the bank. He's just one of my heroes, I got to tell you, in music education. So, um, and, so and what's one, just wanted to, wanted to jump in. Um, yeah. TL, you seem to always be having the next book and reading the next thing, which is, which is great. Um, you're actually the inspiration for the title of this entire podcast. If you're green, you're growing. And if you ripe, you rot. I think you were the one who introduced me to that. Um, so you sort of epitomize that. I don't care how old I am. I think Clark Terry said the same thing. I'm still trying to get better, uh, no matter at what, what age we're in. So um, how do we want to dive into this? Are these, are the 10 that we have, are that's, is that seven from him plus three, or is it sort of loosely inspired by? 
no, it's it's loosely inspired. So it's like uh, you know, ten of uh, of uh, things that I've been thinking about. So yep. it, it's interesting uh, because in terms of the lifelong learning thing, that's like where I'd, I'd like to get started. But I read this great quote uh, actually uh, just yesterday from a Duke Ellington, and this is fabulous. Stagnation ain't going to look good on me, I'm sure. <laughs> so <laughs> Duke Ellington was learning until the very, very end, and he is one of my creative and artistic uh, inspirations. So the, the first thing I'd like to talk about today is uh, the concept that thinking that you're fully cooked. And uh, there are uh, teachers that go out there that they feel that learning ends with the last day of college. Mm -hmm. And it's actually absolutely to the, the contrary of that. Kind of where it starts, right? Yeah, it's it's not the end, but it but it's the beginning. And and the thing is, Kyle, if we expect students to learn, then we have got to be learners ourselves. And you know, I had a, several uh, great situations happen in the course of my teaching career, particularly the latter part of it, when you know we all have bands that are a little bit less talented, depending upon the flow of talent in the room. And uh, why is it that some programs are very consistent in their achievement levels and ones, some others are like up and down? Well, if you have a situation where you might not have the strongest freshman class, uh, are you going to wait like four years to have another uh, good product? And the answer to that is, is no. Uh, what can you do to influence that? Well, the biggest thing that you can do is, as a teacher, I found this, that when I got better, my groups got better. Yep. So it's really, really interesting thing that um, in a couple of situations, I can recall very, very vividly when there was le less to work with. So I looked at it and said, well, I've got to plan better. I've got to program better. I have got to learn more. And I just very simply have to be a better teacher. And at the end of it, those groups were very consistent with the, with the levels that, that uh, we had had for, for, you know, before and, and after. There was no, in a sense, good reason for that, except that I got better. Yep. And that's, we have such powerful, powerful yep. influence on what we do if we continue to grow. And the, and, kids, and the kids never know that you get the, you don't get the credit. You never say, oh, I did better. This one's on me. No, it's still all about the kids. And when you talk about having worse, you know, a lower level of player, we're really, it's about, I think the number one thing is like finding the repertoire that's right for that group. Yep. And, and if that's right, it doesn't matter. You know, I think you told me once I've never judged and said on the tape, there's not enough notes in that program. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yep. So finding that level of, of programming is really, really important. Well, and, and that's like the essential thing. About, I'll be getting into programming a little, uh, and a little bit, but that is absolutely critical. That is the beginning and the end of a uh, successful performance. And a lot of teachers don't realize that. And they also don't do sufficient work in terms of, in terms of uh, researching uh, uh, literature. Um, and um, so my idea as far as like program is concerned is that is a, it's a, it's a year long process. It's an forever process. Mm -hmm. I, I will listen to absolutely anything. Now, maybe it's like 10 seconds of a demo, uh, but that's it. But that con continual search for new sounds, first of all, is very, very invigorating. And you have to be like on, on really, really on top of it. One of the things I love about uh, uh, judging marching band is occasionally we'll run into, and I, I, as you know, I've worked like very, really, really hard to be literate as far as literature is concerned. But you run into pieces on occasion that you, did, you know, you, we're unfamiliar with. I mean, I don't listen to Radiohead all the time and some of the stuff that I hear in various uh, situations. And that forces me to go and to listen to that material and to become familiar with it, but also to, to say to the performing group, you're doing very well with this aspect of it, or you're not, you could make these adjustments based on what the original material is. So it forces me always, you know, to be uh, really with the program. Um, for for me as a teacher, um, this ongoing process, there is a, a, a spot in the middle where we would just sort of pivot. And that was for me generally right after the Midwest Band Clinic. And that is for those of you who have never been to that clinic, um, you need to. Uh, it is a treasure trove of new ideas and great literature. And I would always come back from that with 
five or six pieces that I might not do that next year, but over the course of the, the next several that I would uh, uh, program. And it's all quality literature because Midwest demands that what's played at that uh, uh, conference is... And, uh, and you, have a, you have a list where you write those down, right? So you're like, oh, here, I'm just going to add these to my list. It's not, okay. I'm going to remember them because so many people go, oh, I'll do that piece sometime. Well, no, you won't. No. <laughs> or no. get it on a list so you can look back at it. I take the program after Midwest and the ones that I've circled and written notes about, then yep. I will transfer it to uh, a, another list, which comes a little bit to the pro uh, planning process that uh, I, I would have. And so we can I can start to begin to think about uh, programming in earnest right after uh, Midwest. And it was a, a, a springtime process from, say, the first of the year right up until, I would say, probably – um, the first of May or so, maybe a little bit further, because my objective was to have programs set for the year and uh, for that music to be ordered and in my hand before I left for summer vacation. Because it, it is really, really difficult, as you know, to conduct meaningful score study in the course of all the other things that you're doing. If you're conducting six ensembles or whatever, in Yes, you can do some repair and some soft spots in your preparation, but the preparation needs to be during the summer. And I really like a thoughtful uh, process of just being able to sit down with scores and to do what Frank Battisti advised. You just like read through the score like, you know, you're reading a book and then you start to begin your, your uh, score study uh, process. And so what I would do is I would sit down with like, here are all the tunes are all the pieces that I think are valid that I would like to explore or I haven't explored in the past. Mm -hmm. And I would make giant size lists and then just look through it and say, this is appropriate. This won't work for what we have. It might work two years from now, whatever. And, and do that sort of analysis and then start to get into the whole idea of, okay, how is this going to be uh, fit in, in uh, uh, programs? Now, it's important to note that uh, I made the mistake that so many of us do when I first started teaching, and that was I programmed concert to concert. Yeah. So we did a concert; it was successful. Now here's the here, here's here's the pitfall of that. You then you look and it was like the day after the concert. Well, what do I pull out and what you know what can we do next? <laughs> and you look at what was successful. It's like okay, that tune by composer X was very successful. Let's do something else by him. And I had this happen to me twice, Kyle. I'm not going to name the composers involved, but in both cases, I had that pro programming process and we read uh, the next piece from that same composer. And I had kids say, uh, haven't we played that before? Yep. So that says to, to me, uh, no. And in the case of one of those two composers, I've never after that conducted anything by him. Yep. And, uh, and he's a fine band composer, but so that process started to change, and then I got into the, well, let's program the entire year. Yeah. And it's a fascinating process. I still have that book. I'm, I'm, I may show it to you sometime, this notebook where I start with my first draft, and I keep track of all of the drafts. And it's fascinating to see how it evolves or doesn't. In some cases, I'll start with the program and the very first one. That's what we end up playing. In other cases, there's nothing left from that first draft. I just keep mm -hmm. on adjusting and and uh, you know uh, tweaking as I get, get familiar with new pieces or my thought process changes. I also want to jump in too because yeah. when you have enough experience teaching, you know when a kid when the kids start the piece, you know you do have a grace period of it's not going to sound good maybe right away. And I've had people no. say that when you sight read the piece, if it's the right level, you should be at sixty to seventy percent. You know, there's there's you know some of that, and sometimes that's correct, and sometimes you know not on every piece. But yep. you know, also knowing when you when you've gotten into a piece and it's not going to work with your group, right? I mean, sometimes you just got to push through it and you have to teach it, and that's the purpose. But have you ever actually pivoted and said, you know what, I think this is really going to work, but then you get into it and for whatever reason you just don't get the right vibe and you decide to change the piece? Absolutely, and there are times when I've paid attention to my gut. And I've been very happy with the end result. Yeah. There are times that I just like, no, we're going to like, you know, like uh, tough it out and stuff like that. And I very much regretted it because they were not, their 
instincts sometimes are like better than than ours yeah. and uh, so it's a it's it's a very very fine line but you try to get a real good sense early on like that's like okay this will work for us not it is perfect right now and uh, so that is part of that whole process as a side note as part of that yeah. you know taking kid feedback in the pieces that you're programming that's really big you know i if i do a piece i think i've said this before and none of the kids choose it as their favorite piece i probably won't do that piece again you know yeah. not not that it you know but it's like if all 50 kids chose another piece you know what i mean it's like okay i'll find another piece because i always want to feel like whatever we're working or performing a piece it's at least one kid's favorite song yes because that might be the one kid who's really really uh, very insightful about things and not dealing with it necessarily on an emotional level. It, mm -hmm. it, it, it is a very fine line. And I always uh, would try to like really like zero in on what kids reaction to stuff is, because if they don't enjoy doing it, then they're not going to enjoy the experience. There are some pieces that they will enjoy immediately. There are some pieces that they will want to play that they'll find out later on. It's like, well, that, yeah, wasn't necessarily the best idea some that are a little bit of a tougher sell in the beginning, but eventually they get there. And my, and my approach with that was, <clears throat> if I'm doing something that I know it's going to be a real stretch and it's very, very meaningful, um, and the reaction at the, in the beginning is like, you get a sense that they're not really getting it or digging it, mm -hmm. um, I would work it in very small segments and just like maybe 10 minutes here, not to try to like beat them over the head with it, but to say to expose them to it. And then it gets a little bit better. And then all of a sudden they start to understand, hey, this is like really very good. I didn't like it, you know, uh, initially, but and it was always a great thing at the end after a concert to have a kid walk up to you and say, you know, I really didn't like that piece in the beginning, but now it's my favorite. And you know, I'm, sh I'm sure you've had that same experience. Yeah, a piece of... that comes up to me, two pieces actually by one of our good friends, Andy Boysen, that yep. sometimes hit that. One is Conversations with the Night. The other one yep. is I Am. I mean, two great pieces of music that are very different, but you could see at the beginning kids like not understanding it. By, by the end, it could be really impactful. Well, think of it, you know, a piece like uh, uh, I Am, which is... I think one of the finest pieces written in the last 30 years for, for a concert band. Think about the concepts in there. Now, it's technically pretty modest, but you're talking about aleatoric music and you're talking about a, a very dark subject matter. And it really stretches them emotionally. You know, listen, there's a car crash in the middle of this piece. Yeah. But what you can do in terms of teaching expression and a true musical experience with something like that is absolutely irreplaceable. And in every time, I've, I've conducted that piece on numerous times, in every single situation at the end, the kids are like, this is really, really good. Mm -hmm. And and the other thing that I like about that piece is a little bit of a side trip. To me, it exemplifies Andy's personality and his great, great warmth. I mean, he, if he wrote a piece and, and said to us, well, this is this piece about me, you know, who I am as a human being, it, you know, it, it, it would be that. And a little side, uh, Midwest side trip on that. The first time I ever heard that piece, it was back in the days when uh, Midwest was at the uh, Hilton. And uh, I saw this great, great group, I believe from Texas, uh, performing it in just the opulence of that ballroom at the Hilton and everything else. And it was just such a poignant thing. And I literally, at the end of that performance, and it was such a great performance, but I had tears in my eyes. And I, I, and I like went home and said, we are going to do this piece at, at some point in time. So that, you know, really gets to the quality of, of literature, but the various experiences that you can have um, with this stuff. So, so um, yeah. just to kind of catch people up, we will, this is posted. If you go on the website um, that's on the description underneath the podcast, you'll see these 10 deadly sins listed out. So we're kind of melding them into each other, but I think, TL, we've done the thinking you're fully cooked. Um, yep. The next one was programming by going over the file cabinet and taking out whatever looks good. That's also yep. a no-no. And then yep. programming music that is not suitable for the ensemble. Yeah, let, let me get to, to a, a few of those. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to actually finish uh, with the, uh, the, the programming process and that I happen to mention. It's like, well, now we do... Uh, I program the entire year. 
kind of thing. Yep. But but there was a further refinement that, that came to that. And it was, I looked, because we uh, normally did three concerts. So what is the, what's the target piece of music for the year? Mm-hmm. And then I would program it backwards. So the, the, the last concert was the, the piece of the year. Give us an example. Give uh, us a piece that might be the target piece. So, uh, well, the final target, say, we'll, we'll, we'll say it is uh, the whole suite in F. Okay. And then the middle piece was something that might that will take us to that last piece, but is sort of transitional in the sense that, you know, like technically and all that kind of stuff. That like, and, like something like maybe Pierre LaPlante might fit into that? Pierre LaPlante would perfectly uh, fit into that. Um, and I can recall the year that we ended up doing the, the suite in F, the first piece for the year was a prelude Siciliano in Rondo. Okay. And so we take, took it from there. So we, a little bit something meatier than, although LaPlante's writing is fabulous, but a little bit something meatier in the middle and then to take you to the, to the end. Okay. And the rest of those programs uh, would fall into place pretty easily. But if you get those targets correct, and, it, and there's, there's a sense of sequencing and learning Okay, we're working up to to this uh, particular thing. And one other further thing on that, and it is uh, really jazz band related, and uh, and that is that we take charts, we give them to the kids, and there are all these chord changes and all this kind of stuff, and it's that's that's cool. What if we thought about jazz programming and concert band programming too, but as more than a one year uh, idea? Mm-hmm. So. Uh, one of the things that we did uh, in uh, in Cape, I had a good sophomore class, and I know it, I went as se- seniors. We're going to play. I want to play Cottontail, and as you know, the programming is a several year process. So how do we prep ourselves for that? How do we make the kids be very very comfortable with those chord changes, rather than just throwing Cottontail in front of them in their senior year? And so I, I got together with the with the combo teachers. And I said to them, uh, and this was when these kids are sophomores, we're going to take the next couple of years and you can choose any contrafact of rhythm that you want. Rhythm changes, right? Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Just do rhythm changes. So this is the coolest part. And, and I got to tell you, this is one of the finest moments of, of uh, proudest moments of my teaching career. So all these kids are learning these changes and we get to combo night, which by the way, I call the right brain enhancement night and uh, the community love that, but it's, there's a lot of truth to that. And that's a whole other subject. But so we went in there and I had a freshman combo that did play. I got rhythm. And so they're lined up there and I turned to the audience and started to cherry pick kids. You grab your horn, you, 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 cause the other combo kids are sitting in the audience and they grab their horns we got on uh, like in the, the setup and I just explained this. I said, rhythm, uh, I got rhythm in B flat, uh, two choruses up front, one chorus a piece for the solos and we're going like right down the line, one chorus out and we'll do a sustain note at the end. Yeah. And that was the only prep they had never played before or after together and we got through that and it just proved the whole idea of lingua franca, this language that, that is so universal. And then when we got to, to uh, play uh, Cottontail, it was really successful. And there wasn't much we had to do with the solos because they were so ingrained with it. They had played it for several years. And for anybody who's listening who doesn't know Rhythm Changes, it's based on the famous tune, I Got Rhythm. And there's, you know, Count Basie used it on Jumping Up the Woodside and, you know, hundreds of thousands of tunes since then. But basically, in its most basic format, it's A-A-B-A. Mm-hmm. And the A's are in are in one key. Now, there are a lot of variations to it, right? But in the very simple sense, it's in one key. And then the big part is the bridge, which goes to the three chord in a major format. And then the six and the two and the five. So you have to be able to manage the bridge first and foremost. And then... Once kids can do that, you can give them different versions of the A section, which have other chromatic notes as well. But if people don't know about rhythm changes, I think, TL, we haven't talked about this, but besides a blues, rhythm changes is another huge form that kids should learn to master as they're improvising. That language is 85% uh, percent of it. And by the way, I'll tell you, I have to admit that I'm, I'm still learning the best way to uh, to uh, teach the bridge on that tune. <laughs> so yeah. if they um, know there are major scales. It helps a lot. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, it does indeed. 
Uh, so so the one last thing that I'd like to finish on this uh, aspect of uh, the the fully cooked thing, because it's such a favorite subject of mine. Um, I, I really believe that the larger uh, part is for us to be very well uh, educated and can continue that as we talk about lifelong learning thing. By the way, kids pick up on that. They know, yep. they know when you, when you're continuing to learn, you know, I'll walk into Even to this date, I'll walk into uh, the uh, uh, jazz band rehearsal with TA and it's like, well, gang, I learned something uh, uh, yesterday. And, and they'll just sort of, you know, give me this uh, look, you know, it's like, okay, what do you got for us? And, uh, but I, I want to be a walking example to every student with whom I have contact of lifelong learning because that's the value of band. Beyond the notes that we teach for concerts and whatever, so many of those kids are not going to be playing once they leave school, unfortunately. Yep. Um, but they're all going to be learners forever. And we can educate the total child by really being committed to this whole idea of, of, of lifelong learning. We need to be a great example for them. So one of the things that I try to do in terms of my overall uh, making myself better is um, I read everything that I can get my hands on. And generally, I have three books going on at once. Uh, generally, uh, a jazz history book, because that is my, my hobby, you know, and... Uh, uh, maybe a, a composer biography, um, self-help stuff. I'm really, really into that sort of thing. I just read a thing called The Four Agreements, which is really, really excellent. And it, it's made my teaching so, so much better. Uh, these four simple little concepts of things that you can do. And then then I do generally read something for uh, for fun, like a John Grisham or something of that particular nature. But it is always, always a book or a score in my hand, because that's just the, the way that, uh, you know, the way that I, that I learn uh, best. Um, I, I worked for a guy uh, down in uh, Massachusetts, uh, a legend in music education, Paul Alberta. Alberta. Right? Yeah, Paul yep. Alberta. Yep. And he said to me at one time, he said, Tommy, I'll, um, I'll learn the last thing I learned when they throw the last shovel of dirt on my face. <laughs> and, <laughs> that, and that, you know, when you work with somebody like that for five years, they really have a profound influence on you as, as Paul has. Uh, so my objective, honestly, and, and to this day, I, I practice this, I wouldn't lie. Um, I want to learn s one new thing by seven o'clock every morning. One thing, whatever it is, it's not, and never ever planned. So um, yesterday, I was listening to a uh, a big band recording with a trumpet solo on it, and um, that's like the first thing I get up. I'm doing my morning stuff. There's a recording of some sort, some kind of music going on every day. Well, in this case, the trumpet player on on the album uh, reminded me of of uh, this guy who was a studio player in uh, the '50s in New York, Bernie Glow. For some reason, that name popped into my brain. And so the first thing I did is I just like sat down at the computer, got on Wikipedia and checked out Bernie Glow and was just one other little piece of information that I had. That sort of curiosity, I believe whatever success that I've had as a judge, it is related to that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that uh, curiosity uh, being like wanting to know every possible thing that I can about the, the subject matters at hand. And in, in, uh, you know, Westbrook with your staff, uh, you've seen that approach in action because when I, when we, uh, you know, were evaluating your show last year and all that art, well, it's like, that's like, you know, that's going into the, you know, the candy store for the kid, but, and the process, it was like, okay, I want to learn this about that aspect of Picasso or, 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 uh, you know, Jackson Pollock or whatever. And, getting all that information allows me to be able to give a little bit more of an informed opinion uh, to, to the group uh, group's concern. And I, I suspect that that's something that they value and, and appreciate. Uh, yep. And, but that's part of the vitality of all this, which is, which is so cool. And, so, and when everybody, you know, if you're a judge, you should be able to ask any teacher when they're programming a piece for their kids, like, what are, what's the purpose of this piece? Like, why are they working on it? And sometimes it's for rhythmic concept. Sometimes it's for a key. Sometimes it's for a time signature. Sometimes it's for a musical. 
something, right? But there needs to be some sort of purpose for it. It can't just be they like it or we like it. I mean, very rarely should it <laughs> should it be that, right? But think about like why, w what can this piece offer? And I got to tell you, sometimes I say I'm looking for another 6-8 piece and then I'll find it. But sometimes I'll just find a piece I really like and say, oh, we should do this piece with this group and this is what they're going to learn from it. And you kind of put it in that category. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you're bringing this up uh, brings us actually to, to uh, point number two, which is uh, how some people program and uh, they just like go to the filing cabinet and they start rifling through and the first thing, oh, yeah, this would be good and this would be good and this would be good. I, I've seen people do this. Yeah. And this is that concept because they find three things that'll, you know, th they think will work and there's no thought process um, beyond that. And so the whole idea of having a strategy when you start the year is very, very important. And understand that um, the success or failure of your performances uh, is totally related to what happens before you put a note of music in front, in front of the kids. Yep. You used to tell me 90% of the success happens before the first downbeat. Oh, it, 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 it is because sometimes... And, and I learned this a lot in my years in drum corps and marching band, when when the writing is not correct, and I've lived through some programs, it's like, I know these are great kids, they play well, they should be successful, but what's in front of them is not going to allow that to happen. And invariably, that's what happens. You know, and, and as a tech, it's frustrating. It's like, I know, I, I know this is not going to be successful. But on the other hand, I've seen situations, I remember one year with the Boss Crusaders, Jay Kennedy was the was the brass writer, and, and of course one of the very best that ever has done it uh, in the drum corps activity. And uh, Boston had that year not a great amount of talents, and that was one of the most successful cores. They were like fifth at, at DCI because the writing was was so correct, and Jay made all of those adjustments uh, uh, going on. Mm -hmm. So you, you really need to make sure that the, the program is suitable for the group and not like, I'd like to conduct this piece. Right. Or, or to have the attitude and in, in, in some do, and it's well intended, but you know, I wanted my kids to experience this piece of music. Well, they can't play it. They can't experience it. <laughs> no. And yeah, despite what Vaughn Williams said, something about bad, uh, good music is worth playing poorly or something like that. I, I've never uh, ascribed to that theory, yeah. but I've seen people like really get themselves or their groups into to trouble with that and if they thought just a little bit more so uh, an example say um uh you know the folk song suite okay it's an okay high school band uh but you can't uh, uh, a better example is actually the suite and in, in f the uh, the host um it's like no you, you, your band can't really play that but i know i, I want to play the suite and f well think back one step and look it's like hey wait a minute robert longfield has done a cut down version and his yeah. his stuff by the way is great we can experience this piece of music and without getting ourselves into major major uh, trouble with it so you have your cake and eat it too in that situation and and i'm experiencing that right now because that's one of the pieces that ta is is doing uh and it's it's a terrific terrific um cut down version the essence of the piece is is, is there and it's like well okay you know, if you think about it like one step back, sometimes you can like, really uh, get yourself out for, of For me, when I'm thinking about does this piece fit my ensemble, I literally think of the kids in every section. I think of Susie, who's playing yeah. alto saxophone, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Part, or trombone, three. Oh, my gosh. They couldn't play that part. You know, and if there's more than a couple where it's like, well, it doesn't fit that group. Or say, like, if I have a really young concert band and the second trumpets literally can barely play an octave, right? Well, I need to find music where the second part doesn't go over the break for clarinet and stays, you know, within a certain certain range. So matching up your individual kids with their individual parts is how I look at that. Yeah, and you know what's, what's interesting is when you hear a group, you can tell what the thought process has been with the, with the programming. Yeah. Because if they have a, a thing, for example, that is very woodwind heavy and it's just a, there's a lot of action it is not necessarily ridiculously difficult it really but it spotlights them and it's a very weak woodwind section 
you can do that. I mean, you can work on it all night and all day, and it's not going to really be successful because it's a developmental thing. Maybe that piece would be better next year, Mm -hmm. you know. Uh, And and, uh, one other thing along these lines uh, was is the whole idea that I've heard a couple of teachers uh, speak of, and it it always just it it it, uh, it saddens me because I know what the outcome is going to be. And that is that um, we're going to play this stuff because the kids want to play it kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And yes, their affinity for the music is very, very important. And I'm always like have laser beams on what they're feeling about it or what they yeah. you know apparently think of it. But you can't have uh, a situation where the, the kids, to me, are, are picking the liturgy. You would not go into an English class and have the kids pick uh, the books that, that you're going to read. Now, there is a way around that, though. One of the things that we did at, at a CAPE is the last concert of the year was just the freshman and sophomore uh, uh, concert bands. And I would there would, there would be a, a pop flavor to that particular concert. And on occasion, a kid would, would suggest a piece. And, uh, on, and on, on occasion, we would, we, we would do it. It was never, ever, you have no influence over all of this mm-hmm. I mean, if a kid really wanted to do it and, and argued a good case, it's like, well, we'll learn it, you know. And if we if we don't like it, then we don't have to do it. But it, that gives them ownership, but in a very kind of controlled situation. And there's I've another way people. that there's another way I've approached that is yeah. um, if you say, okay, we well, you have a slot for one movie piece or pops piece. Yeah. Here are five that I approve of. Yeah. And we'll let the kids listen to them and vote on them. And then maybe we choose one that the kids like, but again, not very often. That, sir, is a better uh, process than I had. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in, right. th- it, it, this f- gets into actually point number five here. So we've actually been bapping our way through this pretty well. Um, and that is that uh, concert, the concert or the festival or the competition is the end game. And, and we grew grow up in this situation. It's exactly, we've all been victims of it. We have all uh, imposed it upon others. And I would submit that there is a, uh, there's a higher level of, of thinking. And I think it really comes to what are you looking to accomplish artistically and, and educationally? And if that is going to be your guide, then the event at the end of it is... The least important of, of, of all these things. John Wood, it's a celebration is what it is. Yeah. John Wooden always talked about, uh, he said, it's the journey, not the end. And yeah. it's it's that journey, which is so important that we have a real tendency sometimes to to like like forget in our pursuit of like what it's going to sound like at the concert, no matter what the human cost is. And there is a significant human cost if you think strictly in terms of, of the outcome. But if you think about it in, in uh, other terms, it's like it is a, a process. And, you know, I would always say to, to the Cape kids, and they were, they were great about this. Um, it's like the concert is a snapshot. And by the way, concerts are perfectly expendable, as we found out during, during COVID. So if we make that be the end all and be all, then we have no reason to exist. But if the, if the process is the important thing, then it's a whole other thing. And, and that would allow me to say to the kids, sometimes the snapshot is not a beautiful snapshot. And I always refer them to my, my mother, who when she takes snapshots, she always cuts people's heads off. <laughs> and I said, that doesn't mean that they've been decapitated. It's just like this one moment in time. And if we think about that, and, and what that does is then by changing up the importance of that, yes, they still care about it a lot and they want to perform well, but if something happens in a concert that never ever happened before, and kids can be devastated, and, and as a teacher, you can be devastated, like this never happened before, why did this happen, you know? And and so it does, and when you teach them though, mm-hmm. that it's a snapshot, and that it's perfectly okay to have stuff happen, yeah. you know, not as well as you rehearsed. And guess there's what? No there's no perfect music. There yeah. isn't going to be a perfect. No, because human beings are making it kind of thing. And and they I relate to that very well. But then that, let's see, what, that changes your focus as a teacher to 
I want to make every day be like the perfect day. And this is another woodenism. This is I, I want to make this be my perfect day. You know, for anybody who hasn't listened, like read the John Wooden, TL talked about self-help books earlier. John Wooden, the famous coach from UCLA, you turned on to me on to a lot of his books, and I own a lot of them. I think the best one I've listened to, I've I've uh, read, is called Wooden. Yep. Just his last name, and it's just this art of teaching. It's so amazing. So continue, but I, that's if people are looking for, especially fan directors who like sports, it's a really good genre to, to read. Yeah, well, in, in in my estimation, John Wooden is one of the finest teachers to ever exist in any particular thing because he started off as an English teacher, and uh, the the methodical aspect of how Wooden uh, dealt with things. I mean, he would. Uh, he preserved from like 1934 to the end of his uh, teaching career uh, in like 1974, every like the uh, recipe cards with his uh, practice plans yep. and he, at the beginning of every year. And I did that for a while. I got to tell you, you know, review like the, the process. You he know? would start every they would win a national championship in March. And yep. then at the beginning of the year, three months later, he would teach the entire team how to roll up their socks correctly. Because if they don't put their socks on, they get blisters and then they can't play. So he would every year start, <laughs> I mean, stuff yeah. like that. It's amazing. Well, well think about you're, you're Bill Walton and you're like the most highly recruited center in, in, in the universe. And you walk into this guy's practice and the first thing that he's teaching you is rolling up, you know, your, your, your socks or putting on your socks correctly and making sure that you don't trash the locker room, do you pick up every single kind of thing? I mean, it's, it, it's really, really uh, in, instructive when you, yeah. when you think of, of, of what that was and the love that his players had for him because they understood what they were getting long-term, not winning championships, yeah. but long-term as far as human beings and stuff like that. And the really great coaches are very much along those lines. Another one of my heroes is Vince Lombardi for precisely the same reason. A different style, totally. I mean, Wooden was professorial, uh, if that's a word, and uh, a professorial. I don't know. And uh, and 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 uh, Lombardi was in the gutter kind of thing, you know, just like Ugh, you know, hard uh, school, old school. But they both had the same message, and the players after for the rest of their lives just absolutely adored what they did for them as difficult as they were in each in their own uh, different ways and it's i think it's great as teachers to have those those sort of uh, role models they both have throughout my career had a substantial influence and made me a better teacher there's no doubt about that so love it, love it. Uh, the, the next uh subject we have uh th and this will be a brief one we talk about uh, vertical alignment as being the sole goal and that is a, a really, you know, I'm, I, I live in the world of drum corps still, and they're all about the doctor beat and that, you know, like everything's lined up perfectly and, and everything as else. As clean as possible. And that is one of my my uh, uh, bones to pick with the activity, but, I, it, you know, I'm, I'm certainly well, how, out. How come we don't get more credit when we play dirty at a show, TL? If we play dirty. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's a certain amount of uh, vertical alignment that is necessary to communicate uh, why, whatever why is it a problem why is why is a set you know going with vertical alignment why is that a problem oh yeah well because what it does is it makes the music bloodless if that's the if that's the prime focus and it comes to the way that you teach pieces of music and like when i first started teaching for a long time it was all about let's get it clean you know we can't communicate any musical stuff until it's clean it, but it's a different process and this is something that when i was out at umass bill rowell very much taught me it's like you need to take a small section of music and you need to go at all aspects of of the musicality of it and everything else vertical alignment is a factor obviously clean rhythms mm -hmm. but if you ignore the line if you ignore the expression you ignore all those aspects then you try to put them in later on it, it, it's forced and it's not natural. It needs to be organic. So if, if you take it and just like really shape it and make the intention to uh, to say like this transfer, like later on in this piece, it's going to be the same concept. And uh, Paul Alberta was one of the people that really taught me about that. Paul would sit there and he would do hour after hour after hour on, uh, you know, 20 bars of music. 
Yeah. And it's like, what's what's going on? And, and I actually have a great story along those lines. He conducted the uh, uh, District 1 Jazz Band uh, one year. And uh, we had a rehearsal on, uh, it was a, a Friday. Interestingly enough, the only teacher that showed up uh, other than myself and I was the manager was uh, was Craig, Craig Skeffington. Mm -hmm. And so Paul, at, at the end of the night, I mean, he, he had a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and a little bit of this. He played through nothing. Nothing, no, oh, like one, hey, let's do a run through of this piece. Nothing. It was all over the place. And you just say, what's the deal here? And so we, we finished the rehearsal. And uh, so uh, uh, Paul was having fun with Skeff, and he just said, uh, so uh, how'd, you, how'd you think things went? And and uh, his uh, and Skeff's thing was, well, yeah, I thought it went pretty well. I was surprised you didn't run through yeah, anything or anything like that. And Paul said nothing. He just looked at him. He said, I think things went great. So we went to the the uh, the the next day, which was the uh, rehearsal, uh, the uh, district meeting, and then the latter part of the rehearsal. And so we show up the first part of it in like the first hour of rehearsal. It was the same thing. He didn't go through anything. He went back to the stuff that he had done before. You know, it's like, wait a minute, I, you already taught that. What's, uh, you know, and we're looking at each other kind of thing. But I, at least I knew his modus operandi. I haven't worked with him. So the, so we go to the district meeting and uh, an hour later, we go back to the rehearsal and all of a sudden he's playing this stuff and like it sounded great because he very simply took the concepts that he laid out in the beginning it's like, okay, this transfers. And he would never ever say it in those specific terms, but that was going on. All of this transfer, and all of a sudden, what seemed to be a disaster band in the course of like one hour was completely flipped. And because at the concert... He knew, he knew the essence of each piece, and he was able to take the key components to that piece and work on those. Absolutely. And, and he would also go at it from the viewpoint of, okay, th these are the things that are like the nasties in this thing. If we get this mastered, then the other stuff that surrounds it will really, in, in some sense, take care of itself. And he was teaching an, an aesthetic and an approach. And it was, I, I wish that everyone could have been in the room, uh, you know, for those rehearsals, because it was just absolutely a, a textbook. So um, the, the next thing we have on our list is uh, that uh, judges of the problem. And uh, this is one I grew up with, again, in drum corps. Uh, and it was just, uh, I'm, it was so unfortunate that our, our uh, staff dealt with it in this way. And that was that they would always refer to a specific, oh, you know, these guys don't know what they're doing. They're the locals and stuff like that. And we, if we go out of state, you know, we're going to really get these great, great judges who were the same level of judges that we were dealing with every week, but we didn't know it. So we'd cross the line into Connecticut and all of a sudden those guys are geniuses. You know what I mean? It's like, no. And so when you have any sort of a group that's evaluated, and it, it's more difficult in a competitive music thing, but you, you this absolutely applies. The judges are not the problem. They really aren't. Are some better than others? Yes. Is judging improved? Yes. And, and I'll say particularly in the state of Maine, since uh, Jim Vitigliano took over the marching band thing, he's really, really worked to get the best possible people. So the quality of, of judging is improving, but a lot of it comes from the mindset of the, of, of, of the teacher. And the kids, will, the, the kids will act like the teacher. There, there is, there is set by the teacher. There's zero doubt about that. When kids can't deal with competition in the right way, it's because that's the that's what's been taught. You know, the, the old thing from South Pacific, you've got to be carefully taught. Well, that's in that situation, that sort of a mindset. And, uh, you know, thankfully, that has changed very, very much up in these parts uh, uh, down through the years. But um, if if the uh, teachers have the, the right approach with the kids and re very respectful for what they're getting, the kids will respect it, too. And you know, I can speak as my role as a, a, a chief music judge for uh, mass judges. This is like an ongoing discussion for us. And the whole idea is we're looking to have a symbiotic relationship between the judging community and the groups that we, that we adjudicate mm -hmm. so that the groups feel that the, the, the judges are an extension of, 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 of the staff. 
and you're, we're in this together kind of thing as opposed to here's this other force out there that doesn't want us to be successful. I mean, I can tell you as a judge, judges never ever enjoy uh, like we're uh, adjudicating a very, very poor performance because we feel, and it, it, a lot, most times it's teacher related, the reason that it's, that it's not a good performance, yeah, but we, you never ever want a group of kids to sound bad and you always want them to be successful. So we bend over backwards to, to achieve precisely that. And it is part and parcel of what MJA is uh, these days. And we really, really believe that, that we work together. And, and I think that the relationship, <coughs> excuse me, between the judging community and the bands has improved a lot down through the years. Um, I can recall a few bands when I first started judging uh, up in these parts that were not very receptive to what they were being told. Yep. And as a judge, it was frustrating. It's like, I just want these kids to sound better. I just want this band to be better. And the teacher sometimes was, was getting in the way. So That's, like, there's, there's the phrase I like that says, it's, it doesn't matter who's right, it's about doing what's right. So what do you do if, as a teacher, you are receptive, but you feel like that what you're hearing from the judge is something you disagree with? Then very simple, you go with your own uh, best judgment. That's a, a, what I like to do in those situations is, is suspend my ego because a lot of times it's like, okay, I really believe this and someone else is saying that, it, it, that it's, they have a, a polar opposite you know, uh, approach to things. They may be right or they may be wrong. So I want to eliminate the possibility of them being right. And some of it is you evaluate it and say, okay, this is an area of strength for this judge or not an area of strength for this judge, and I'm going to uh, evaluate that information in, 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 in that way. But a lot of times, I'll tell you, it, caught, it, it gives me pause. I say, okay, why, why am I not getting this? Or why is, is he not getting it or she not getting it? And, uh, and that is the educational process that can happen in a critique situation too. And I, I found that most judges are amenable to those sort of things. Uh, I think it's important as a judge, if you have made an error, that you are very much upfront about it and mm -hmm. to say, you know, I, I, that, was a, that was not a good call on my part. And that's not the way that it used to be. It used to be the judge was omnipotent and you couldn't admit you were wrong and it was a sign of weakness. I, I had one happen, I w was doing a Nesba show last year and uh, I uh, had this one band and th their number was decent. It was sort of middle of the pack. And uh, I overreacted to the band that was in the, in, in, ended up uh, placing first in the division and maybe overreacted a tiny bit with the, the band that was, was third. And uh, afterwards, I, you know, I thought about it and I talked to the chief judge. And I said, I'd like to reach out to this band director. And what I said in that situation is very simply, I had this group a little high. I had this group, uh, I had you guys a little bit low. Uh, next time I see you, if I see you again, I will try to make an adjustment. Now, I didn't flip it totally, but and what was interesting about that is, first of all, the judge was not prepared. I mean, the uh, uh, band director was not prepared to have a judge, uh, you know, like make that sort of admission. Yeah. And I didn't think it was it was uh, uh, admitting uh, anything that made me seem weak. It's like, no, I, I have to do what's right in this situation. Mm -hmm. And... The, the the director was deeply deeply appreciative of that interaction and what could have been a negative interaction was a really really positive one right. and so we can if we treat things in that way the dialogue just becomes so much uh, uh, better and uh, so much more of benefit to to the groups for sure that's so great because kids know everybody's human so uh, yep. understanding those mistakes is big Oh, and, and, and it's tough. I got to tell you, you know, uh, when in the days in which uh, the state jazz festival was was um, um, a bowling trophy. Well, it, yes, the, yes, the trophy thing. Uh, one of my groups ran into a thing where where the judging very simply was not was not at the quality that, that, it, that it needed to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were doing we were doing a moat and swing, actually. And. I had to tell you, I, I listened to that recording probably 200 times because because we, it was a repertory band. We wanted to get every single detail correct. So we um, 
went to the district festival, Doug Owens was judging and Chris Oberholzer, and both of them said, interpretively, like, you, you like, hit it. This is really good. You have some technical things to work out, but interpretively, it's it. We get to the state festival, and one of the directors, who is not from a fabulous background, but, I mean, one of the uh, judges, rather, said, uh, well, you know, in uh, this piece, when you, when you add dynamics uh, and you overdo them, uh, it is uh, it detracts from your performance. So they never Every, listened to the original. No, be, <laughs> well, because they didn't have enough knowledge to understand that New Testament, Count Basie, was was wildly uh, expressive as far as the dynamic contrast. But the stuff before the so-called Old Testament bands were very compressed. You know, in the days when Lester Young was in the band, so. You know, that was one thing. And then on that same panel with another judge, uh, we were doing uh, Oak Loop Parker. Uh, no, I'm sorry. We were, it's actually on, on Moton Swing. And uh, so on the Basie recording in the 50s, Frank Foster was the tenor soloist. He was also emulating Lester Young. And Lester Young had a very compressed uh, tessitura that he used and very compressed in terms of the emotional highs and lows. It's just this. It was beautiful sound and beautiful notes, but that's what it was. And uh, so um, we had one of the judges, and he, he expected the saxophone player to, to play like Michael Brecker or something on this piece. Oh, you got to do more X, Y, and Z, which is exactly contrary to yeah. what the kid had been taught. And uh, so the kid comes up to me afterwards, and he said, what's the deal? And it, w it was really, really tricky. It was really tricky. And all I was able to say is, well, well he looks at it a little bit differently than I do. I couldn't say any more than that, rather than, you know, in, in both cases, they didn't know the literature. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, they gave the wrong information to the group, you know. And, and that's as when. A we, as a teacher, you're kind of pushing the judge to learn more. Oh, yeah. And, and so that actually was the impetus for us uh, stopping to uh, doing the uh, State Jazz Festival because yeah. I, there was a, it was a fork in the road. I really believed uh, with uh, Cape, the repertory band was where all, all the real, real basics we were able to teach them. And it was a very special thing because it was like, it was just, it was unique. And I looked at it and I said, it would take me 15 minutes to program something that these guys will, would love and we would win the bowling trophy and, you know, maybe. And, uh, and I looked at it and said, no, we can't give up something that's very, very important because as well intended as they were, they didn't have the background to be able to evaluate us properly. And that sounds like a little bit, you know, like uppity kind of thing, but it isn't. At a certain point in time, you know, when you have enough experience, you know, and that really comes around to your original question about having a, a disagreement with a, a judge's viewpoint. Yeah. At a certain point in time, you really, really, with humility, have to trust yourself. Great. Okay. So we have three more on here, and I want to remind yep. people that if they go on the Growing Band Director website or click on the link below uh, the podcast, you can click on this and find it, The Ten Deadly Sins, because it, I have it printed out and, and on my bulletin board in my office because it's just to see the bullet points really makes it super clear as to all the things. And at, our conversation is sort of running together, right? But these are very kind of maybe distinct different things for us to think about. So the last few um, are all about parents and kids. Yeah. Um, a lot of times we look at a parent interaction uh, is a chore rather than an opportunity. And I read uh, recently something that was really great that the a teacher's first interaction uh, with a parent should be a positive one because mm -hmm. parents just hear from teachers when the kids are not doing a good job. And one of the things I got into a habit of when I was teaching at Cape, and this really, really paid off in so many ways, is that if a kid was doing a really good job, I wouldn't email them. I wouldn't even call them. I would just like sit down and write them a little note. You know, you would be very proud of your child because of X, Y, and Z. And uh, so many parents, you know, came back to me afterwards. It's like, that was like, that was like so neat, you know, because they want to get uh, positive reinforcement. They're trying their best as parents to do a good job. And, and every once in a while you have a parent in that setting say, 
boy, I didn't recognize my kid. They're a lot different at home. <laughs> right. And it, it's huge. We think of it as teachers. We care so much about these kids, but I mean, their parents care about them infinitely more than we do, no matter how much we try. You know, these, yes. this is their lifeblood. This is their number one purpose in life. So yep. just understanding that, you know, you're right. The parent has to be on your side and they have to want what's best for their kid. And if there's some sort of fight there, yeah, there's a chance there's an, a wrong on either side. But really just understanding that, especially those people who are not parents, like, you know, they know this child from the minute they're born up till now. So trying to learn as much as we can from the parents while also educating them and educating the kids. And that's why I loved parent teacher night. Um, we, we had them um, a couple times a year in, in Cape and I would get a lot of parents, like maybe over the course of a couple of days, 50 parents and, uh, and that's pretty, I mean, it's a pretty intense thing where you just like zeroed in on one individual for those 10 or so minutes, but it's really, really intense. Uh, very few problems. Uh, I mean, every once in a while, you know, a parent would would uh, mention something or like my kid doesn't practice a lot or whatever kind of thing. But uh, a lot of times you can get insights about the kids mm -hmm. uh, when you're just like when, when you're talking to parents. And uh, that's what I loved. And I, I would always, you know, say to a, to a parent, um, you know, um, I love a good conspiracy because mm. if the parent and the teacher is on the on the same page, you're really going to get some positive uh, benefits. And uh, when I was in when I was in Cape, we had this this uh, were twins, identical twins. One played trombone, the other played trumpet. Good musicians. Their granddad was a cantor in Portland, the Messerschmitts. And uh, multi-talented. I mean, they played piano and they played guitar and like whatever. And so the the father would come in, and every uh, for for three straight years he came into parent teacher conferences, and the conversation would be, you know, boy, I'd like to have the boys, you know, into the you know like join the join the jazz band. I think they really love it. They would get a lot out of it. And the father is all like, oh. You know, don't tell me that because I've I, I've been totally unsuccessful. I've been trying to get them to do it. So anyway, this happened three years in a row. The fourth year, when they were fred, when they were seniors, um, both of them joined jazz band, and it wasn't because of anything that either of us did. It was one of their buddies said, "Hey, you ought to join jazz band." They joined it, and then one of them came up to me at one point in time and said, "I wish I had done that before." Yeah. And I just like, yeah, yeah. I've been telling you that for three years. And uh, the father and I had a, had, a, had a good laugh about that. But I, I've really been able to make some major, major ground with some kids that are having a little bit of a problem and trying to find their way mm -hmm. uh, by being in that situation with, uh, with, with a parent. And to have the parent say, if there's any problems whatsoever, let me know. They're very, very seldom were any problems as a, after a conversation of that sort. So they are su such natural um, allies. And my next point, it goes along of, we oftentimes underestimate parent power. And I think in these days, it is really, really very, very important. Uh, more important now than ever post COVID because some uh, principals in some localities are using this as an opportunity to really cut back seriously on music contact time. Like the whole idea of band for a half a year yep. is like something that's really starting to catch hold. Yep. And if parents allow that to happen, then they get by to the band program. Oh, you have the muscular development that doesn't happen. You, you don't like lift weights for six months and then, then sit on the couch for the next six and pick it up. I mean, that's, it, it, so the muscular development, the, the musical development, everything else, in some situations gets cut in half, mm -hmm. which means what you can deal with in terms of literature gets seriously compromised. If parents really have, if they're really, really effective and they know how to, how to lobby, um, they, they, in not every case, but in a lot of cases, would get a lot further than, it, than if a teacher is complaining about scheduling or something of that nature. Because... They're the taxpayers, and they can walk into a principal or a superintendent and say, I'm a taxpayer in this community, uh -huh. and I demand to know X, Y, and Z. And uh, principals sometimes in that situation get a little bit funny because they'll go to the teacher and say, well, call off the dogs. And so if you're going to uh, be in a situation 
in which you want to utilize parent power, there needs to be an element of you're not directly connected with it. So, you know, I, I would I would find the smartest, if you're having a scheduling problem or anything of those lines, I would find the smartest, most influential uh, a parent that's out there, might be president of the band boosters or not, and just very simply have a conversation with them and just to say, I can't be directly connected with this, but here is what's going on, mm -hmm. and have them start to ask questions. And a lot of times, like they very simply, uh, they very simply will. I mean, in, yep. in, uh, and yeah, because administrators we, like to do things, and I don't, I don't want to put ill intent to it, but they like to do things sometimes when not everybody knows about it because it's just easier to implement it without people questioning. They, they, they do, and particularly in terms of scheduling, they do what is easiest for them. Yep. You know, um, I, when I was in Cape, I had first of all the best principal that like known to like human, human uh, endeavors uh, in Jeff Shed, and. Uh, at one point in time, they were doing a, uh, uh, a um, adding a, a, a lab uh, for one of the science courses, and he picked up the uh, Rasta for the uh, wind symphony, and it's like there was like 20 kids that were missing. Yeah. And now, in most situations, the administration would say, well, the kids have to decide. Well, if kids are driven to be successful academically, then the thing that gets cut out in that process is, is generally music, not because of its value. It's just how society values this stuff. So in this case, and Jeff Shedd phone warned me because I didn't even know what the deal was. And he said, yeah, there's a, there's a, there was a problem with your schedule, uh, but uh, I'm on it. And so he sat down and with a director of guidance, ha hand scheduled every single one of those kids so that they could take the lab, they could also take the wind symphony. He just moved stuff around and stuff like that. A lot of times guidance offices uh, offices don't think outside the box. They don't think in terms of like, well, there are other options. The easy thing is to say the kid has got to choose. That's the easiest thing in the world to say. Yes. And that's where parent power comes into play too. It's like if they sit down with the, the guidance counselor or the principal or whomever and say, my kid needs to be scheduled for band. I don't know how you do it. Let's get creative with it, but you have to do that. And that will get a lot more influence than let, letting them make that particular decision. And the whole thing about, well, you have to choose, that is a false equivalent. Yeah, you don't. And so actually the one last point that I had, giving up on a, on a kid. And uh, Walter Chestnut was... Uh, Perhaps my biggest mentor in education, the trumpet teacher out at UMass, um, really responsible for any success that I've had in, the, in this uh, field. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a, a statement that he said to me one time, and he said, Tom, you need to realize that there is a child behind every instrument. Yep. And, and that to me was profound because it, it caused me to take a look at my rehearsals and interactions with kids I flip the switch. It's like, okay, I'm the kid. You know, what is, what are my feelings about TL right now? Well, what, you know, how I'm being dealt with and everything else. Tom, and, and um, it, uh, Tim Lotzenheiser says that. He says, clasp your hands together quickly, right? And then he says, now quickly do it with your fingers in the other, in the opposite way and how awkward that is. And he says he uses that as looking at, an op at something from the other, somebody else's point of view. Oh, and, and the thing is, it, it, it's humbling. You know, some moments that I've had in, in my career, not a ton of them. You know, I was fortunate to have, uh, I think, good relations with most of the kids that I ever taught. You're never going to be the answer for every single kid down the line. But there were a, a few cases that I looked at it and and it was really humbling. It's like, oh, you know, I wish I could start all over again with this situation. Mm -hmm. or I wish I, it would be something different. Uh but that's really, really valuable in the overall scheme of things. And it allows you to, to see the world uh, through kids' eyes. Every kid that we have, Kyle, has aspirations and hopes, no matter how together or not together they are. Whatever, there is something they want to achieve in life. And, of course, if you can find it out, that's so much the better. But if we look at it in that, that, that most kids, or all kids, really, that I've ever dealt with, want to do the right thing. Yep. And sometimes they're not, you know, they're not as successful at it. The other thing is the kids learn at a different uh, rate. 
So that it, not only in terms of the musical skills, in terms of social skills and being able to deal with an ensemble, you know? And mm -hmm. so I, I find myself, the more that I do this, becoming more and more patient with certain things that are, that are hard Absolutely. to, uh, to hard, hard to fix. You don't just walk in and say, bam, this is what it is, because that's not how kids are at this point in time. And that's not the worst thing in the world. If we have to be able to, in our own mind, justify what we're doing, I think that that's great. But I have to be willing to, uh, to have an interaction with a kid in a very anonymous way, uh, you know, like uh, five times a week about a cell phone. Yep. <laughs> You know, I that, mean, that, that also links back to the first one, which was thinking you're fully cooked that if you understand it from their point of view, then you might learn something and it might help the overall situation. Oh, 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 there's no doubt about that. And when you find ways of dealing with some of those behaviors you need to be to be changed, yeah. uh, then it, it, it's a whole different world. And uh, this whole idea that kids learn it at, at a different rate, that's something that I've learned in the last bit of teaching that, that, that I, I've been doing. I mean, the, the TA, TA kids have been really, really wonderful. And there are a few who, who are still a little bit behind the curve in terms of the really getting the uh, like culture and behavior the way exactly that we, that we want it. I can't get impatient with that. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't, uh, uh, you know, like, have any positive effect if I, if I if I'm like negative about it or making judgment or oh, that kid is like whatever no it's going to take longer and my thought is if it takes until the you know, like the last rehearsal that we're together yep. then at least we have solved the problem eventually and I'm not blaming them about it I'm not angry about it at all it's like it's I I have to be persistent in a very very quiet way so well well you know that kind of circles around I think all of these are great and if we were to bring out one thing from this, thinking you're fully cooked is probably the one, right? Always be a lifelong learner. Um, and I'll remind you know people again one more time that the list will be on the, the website on the link to click it. Print it out so you can see these. That's what I've done and it, it's had a profound impact. Um, TL, you, you help a lot of people, I think, um, through your mentoring of other teachers. Would you be willing for me to, to share your email address so if anybody listening to this maybe had a question or a conundrum or a, uh, an opinion of yours on something, is that something you'd be willing to do? I would be way, way cool with that. And uh, maybe uh, one further thing, and that is just uh, uh, any teachers who may be listening, if at any point in time that you ever feel that uh, I could be of help to your program, whether it is helping you with programming or uh, having a visit at your school, Anything of that sort, uh, if you would please uh, get a hold of me, I'd be more than glad uh, to uh, to do it because um, we're all in this together. W w would you just out loud, would you just say what your email address is so people could contact you if they want? Sure. Thomas P, as in Peter, Lizotte, L-I-Z-O-T-T-E, and that's at gmail.com. Thank you so much. TL, it's been a pleasure. Hey, thank you, Kyle. Thank you for listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe too. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, if you have the time, we highly recommend the After Sectionals podcast for more great listening. Thank you for listening to the Growing Band Director. See you next week.